Hello and welcome to a chapter on network security. So uh, today we are going to talk about um, how to secure your network that includes all the devices and um, <clears throat> we'll talk about firewalls, the DMC, the network address and, and network address, uh, address translation <coughs> protocol um, and so on and network access and all of that. So network security through the network devices. All the applications are designed written with security in mind nowadays. So a network must provide um, protection, of course. <clears throat> in your network, we're talking about all the devices, including the workstations, the servers, the routers, the switches. And we got to make sure that the physical and the logical uh, protection are there. So we'll talk about specifically each one of them. When we are building a network, we got to make sure all the devices are hardened and they are protected. We need to know what the different technologies are that are out there and how to design your network so that it is scalable. That means it's easy to expand. It is secured and um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, easy to maintain as well. And we'll probably we're going to get into that um, in a different course, but for now, um, the OSI model is designed in the 1970s. Has the seven layers for those who are taking the network course, the basic network course, um, the took the basic network coursing or any type of network coursing. They're probably familiar with the OSI model, but it really it is designed to go over how data gets encapsulated from the application layer all the way down to the physical layer. So um, this is probably a review. For, by the way, this course is uh, this uh, this chapter for some of you might be a quick review of some of, some of the material we covered um, in other classes. But here are the seven layers of the OSI model. If you take any type of communication course in any college they are going to go over the open system interconnection models and i want you to write these down the seven layers are the application presentation session transport network data link and physical and at least write each function the function across if you want to describe them that's fine but the function is important a mnemonic to remember the seven layers that i always use is all people seem to need data processing. You'll never forget them. And that's from top to bottom. That's how you encapsulate data. So at the application layer, for example, if you want to send an email, your email is converted into raw data. Then it goes through the presentation session where it sets up the presentation, sets up the data, how it's going to be formatted. If it's italic, bold type, encrypted, then you open up a session. You know, you open up the channel between the two guys to communicate with. Then the transport layer, the TCP or the UDP is in there. Um, sets it up to communicate. How should we control the transmission? That's what TCP is for. And make sure that the data reaches there. Then that, then the dispatch to the network layer where the net network layer identify the location, the network where routers, this is where routers operate at the network layer trying to find the best path to reach the destination, the network. And then the data link layer is when you're communicating with devices within the LAN. That's where the MAC address comes into. And then all of that, and, and then when you encapsulate and you put all the labels on the data as they go down the line, before they exit your neck, you place the MAC address, you play MAC address on the frames, and then the frames is placed on the physical layer the wire when they leave again as you probably some of you already know we go this into details in our in our uh, cisco networking class hubs what are hubs hubs are devices that interconnect device uh, hosts in a local area network the um the advantages of hubs and probably the only advantage of hubs are is it allows you to to connect to all the devices 
um, in a LAN. Here's what I want you to write about hubs. You don't have to write all of that. Number one, write the following. <clears throat> hubs are a phys physical layer or layer one device. They have no software, which means no intelligence. Uh, they interconnect all the devices in the LAN. So if you send a frame to a port on the hub, the hub will send that frame to everyone. It's a broadcast to everyone. The more users are on a hub, that's another point, the more users on a hub, the slower the connection is going to be, the lower the performance is going to be. And also, last point, hubs, the, the bigger the... <clears throat> the more the more devices uh, the more devices connected to a hub the bigger the collision domain that means most likely there are more and more data will be collided and corrupted and then they have to retransmit and that's what really uh, brings down the performance okay we don't really use hubs anymore because uh, switches the prices are so cheap that uh, there is really no need for a hub but a hub can be used as a repeater because once data goes into the port the data, the, the ports on the hub are also repeaters, which means they amp, re amplify and regenerate the signal and send it so it can go farther. Otherwise, there's no need for it. If you think you're going to need your data to go very far and you have a hub laying around, you probably can use it, but a switch can do the same thing. Okay, switches. Here's what I want you to know about switches, right? The following them. Switches are layer two or data link layer devices. <clears throat> they are, they have some intelligence, which means they can make decisions on based on the MAC address. They filter frames and they send it to the destination according to the MAC addresses. Switches isolate collision domains. That means the <clears throat> Each port on the switch, this is another point, each port on the switch is its own collision domain, um, which is better than having the whole, all the ports on the hub, right? Um, switches allows you to create VLANs, another point. And what that means, VLANs mean, for those who don't know, it's like a virtual switch within a switch. We can move ports around. You can create multiple virtual VLANs on the switch. And you can manage it. There's software in it that you can secure it. You can secure the ports, control who can go in and out, and so on. And <clears throat> we'll talk about port mirroring and network tap in the upcoming slides in a few minutes. But here's a typical... Um, design of a local area network. Here's your router. This is at the core layer, which is connected to the outside world. Then you connect to a switch. And here where all the access layers are. This is like a distribution switch. And this is the access. So you have a core distribution and access layer. This is where all the people will access the internet, the hosts. So this could be on one LAN. This is another LAN. And this is another local area network. A port mirror means when the data comes in, you can, you set this port so that every single frame that comes into the switch has to be copied to this port. So this device will take the data and take a look at it. As we will discuss later on, you want to set this device, this monitoring computer, with, uh, is going to have something called an IDS, an intrusion de de detection system. So all the frames are coming into the switch will be sent to this device and this device will try to detect if there is um, an attack or not. If, they, if he gets suspicious, it immediately will send, you do, typically there's a firewall before the router, will send an alert to the firewall and to tell the firewall to block the incoming data. The problem with this is if he notices attack, the attack is already in and it probably created, you know, screwed things up in the on the network, created harm. Um, so what we're going to do is instead of having an IDS in here, we'll put called an IPS with a P, an intrusion prevention system, so that if the data comes in, it is in line 
with the incoming traffic, we analyze it. If we sense there is, um, if the IPS senses a, an attack, it immediately stops it, prevents it from coming in. The only disadvantage of IPS is, is that uh, it hinders traffic as it comes in, slows it down a little bit, but so what? Most network use IPSs, you know, because they really, really have the pretty good speed, but this is the only way to really 100% to be secured. All right, so a networked tap, a network tap is a device that can be connected between the firewall and your router and monitors all the data as it comes in. Um, that's fine. By the way, this, as, as we will discuss later on, this type of setup, I like to put the firewall before the router. As if your router is only to route data on the internet, that's fine. Oops, sorry about that. If your data is only, but if it's not, if your router, for example, does other functions such as DHCP, maybe ACL, maybe NAT, because you could do a lot of stuff with it, then you probably want to protect it and put another firewall or this, this firewall up front so it can filter out that package. Because if, you're, if an attack happens on the router and your router crashes, then you have no connection to the outside wall and it may harm your network. All right, so protecting the switch. How do you protect the switch? Although we're gonna go in the details of each one of them, you can use MAC flooding. Um, you can use MAC address inter impersonations. R poisoning, which we discussed, port mirroring, network tap. Somebody can come in and set up a port mirroring on one of your switches, which means he's going to capture all the frames that are coming into that switch. So you got to make sure we can secure that, secure those ports. So please write down the type of attacks that can be done on a switch, these four different ones, and how um, security defense, how do you take care of it? All right, we will address most of these in our upcoming security classes in, and the Cisco as well. Okay, routers. Routers, I want you to write the following about the router. Sorry about that. I want you to write the following about a router. A router is a layer three, the network layer device. It, um, it is used to, to connect LANs together from one network to another network, unlike a switch connects devices together in the LAN. Routers, uh, they run routing protocols such as RIP, OSPF, EIGRP. The routing protocols are used to find the best path to the destination. That's what interconnects the internet. There are public routers free of use that connect multiple that's what the internet stands for, the internetworking of multiple public lanes. These routers are extremely fast, right? And, but today's routers, especially Cisco routers can do many, many other things. They could act as a firewall, like a security guard. They could act, they can do NAT, translate the IP, public IP address to, uh, to private and vice and vice versa, they can act as an IPS. Um, tr look for um, signatures, you know, patterns of attacks and block them. They can be DHCP servers. You can set them up as VPNs. I'm mentioning all of that because we will do all of this in our networking classes. Load balancers. You can actually, if you have multiple links connecting to your destination, you can use most of all the links to allow you to load balance. So you can have better bandwidth and more redundancy. So if one link goes down, you still have multiple connections to reach your destinations. We will do this in uh, one of our Cisco classes in, uh, and we will configure switches that way to allow, and it's called um, ether channel. So we can have, instead of, let's say, if you have eight ports on a switch that are running 100 megabits per second, 
you can use up to eight ports and gives you 800 megabit connection. Why not use, you know, ports that are not being used, right? All right, so though those are the advantages of load balances. Again, it improves the performance, better security, and um, allows for allows redundancy. Okay, now firewalls. Firewalls could be a hardware or software. Um, it could be a different concentrator or an appliance, a device by itself. If you have a big network, it's probably a good idea to have a firewall. Um, here's what I want you to know about a firewall. This is what I want you to write down. I'm going to just give you the what's a firewall analogous to and you want to write that down so this way it's easier to remember. A firewall is a security guard at the gate of, of your network, your building, right? And the security guard has a list of entries. Uh, of who is permitted and who is denied entrance, either in or out, right? So you can tell the security guard, look for people coming into the net, into the router and or out of the router. You typically we set it up on a router to act as a firewall, into the network or out of the network. However, it is that you want to set it up. Uh, so you will look for if if the packet is, says. If somebody comes in and he's on the list, he or she is on the list and it says to deny them, then they are denied. If they are on the list and they are permitted, then they are permitted. If you're not on the list to either be permitted or denied, then you are automatically denied. So there's an implicit denied all by firewalls, unless you say so, unless you say permit everyone else. Therefore, because there's an implicit deny at the end, there um you will, uh, you'll have to have at least one permit statement. You have to allow the firewall to permit something. All right. So remember what you need to write down is firewalls is an analogous to a security guard. And he has a list of what packets are allowed or not allowed, permitted or denied into the network. All right. So there's your firewall again. If, if this network, if this router is only designed to connect to the internet and doesn't do anything else, that's fine. But if it does a lot of other functions, you probably want to move the firewall up front and protect it. That will be the first line of defense in this case. I'd like doing that because most of our routers will is usually set up to do DHCP and connects to the inside network. So we want to definitely protect it. Firewall, uh, this is what we're talking about. They, um, they either allow block or ask, but they usually don't do that. Ask for what actions you should do. They keep a log of everything that is going on, what happened, who came in, who did they block, who did they permit, when they did it, and so on. In case something goes wrong, um, you'll be able to find out exactly what happened. Okay, and you can set, check all, that, all those settings for you. Okay. We'll talk about again. We will be able to set up firewalls in our class in our security classes. Okay, there is imagine a security guard, a stateless packet filtering is like a security guard in the front door. If you're permitted to come into the network, you go in and then you can free to go wherever you want. They don't keep track of the state of the connection. You can go anywhere you want. Uh, it's okay. But it's probably if somebody fools the firewall and they were able to get in, they can they create and then go do something else and screw things up on your network. They may end up not going to where they're supposed to be going. They go into other servers and switches and spread viruses or whatever because they were able to go and pass through the firewall. On the other hand, if you set up a stateful packet tracer, is like the security guard you come in and you say, I want to go to room 217. So the security guard will say, okay, go to room 217 and he'll keep an eye on you and make sure you went to, to room 217 and you did not deviate and go somewhere else. And if you did, it'll cut off, cut you off and then you'll lose connection. So in other words, a stateful packet, um, a stateful packet filtering firewall keeps an eye on the connection, which is good. And there's also what we call 
content-based firewalls. Not only are you going to go to room 217, but he actually checks the data. What are you trying to do to room 17? If there's something in there that is inappropriate and no good, you get cut off too. If you say, I only want to do certain things that allow you in and make sure you do what you were exactly said that you were going. That's the, you can call it web application, but you know, we call it a, a content-based firewalls. Look deeply into the packets. A lot of people, but remember, if you do that, um, it's going to take more time and it's going to slow connections. So the more security you apply, the um, you are hindering traffic and performance. And uh, of course, users don't like that. Well, that's too bad. You want to make sure because if somebody gets hit and and you get an attack, it's a much bigger headache. Um, I'd rather uh, take the um, be a little bit late in terms of performance than um, than worry about um, people. Uh, you know, than wor worry about when you get a get an attack. That's a big big headache. A proxy server. A proxy server is designed to do a, a job for you. So, for example, um, you can if you want, you can have a proxy server that caches in all the web pages from all over the internet that everybody wants to go to. So instead of keep going out to the internet, you go to your proxy server, your proxy server does all the work for you. So if it goes in and grabs all the web pages and all of those work for you, and you just go into the proxy server and get all of that for you, it's safer because if anything goes wrong, the proxy server gets screwed up. If let's say uh, viruses come in and all that other crap or attacks, your proxy server is doing all of that for you. It's really nice if you can set that up, connect it to the outside world, right? So it can it can do a lot of work for you, uh, but then you have to you know you have to set it up. But it still has to be protected, of course. It's not designed to really 100% protect you from all attacks because it could be manipulated too. All right, so you probably want definitely want to set it behind a firewall or even a VPN. Okay, here's a typical uh, proxy server connections. They can increase the speed, for example, they reduce the costs, improve management and stronger security. All right, so please write that down. The advantages of proxy servers, they increase speed, reduce costs, improve management and strong, sec stronger security. Reverse proxy servers doesn't they're really the, the other way around is they don't um, serve the clients. They route incoming requests to the correct server. So for data that's coming in, they send them to the appropriate internal network devices. They don't take any requests from hosts, right? Uh, reverse proxy IP addresses is visible to you know the proxy server is out, you know the outside world talk to it. They send the data to it. There's a lot of people usually doing that. He's the one that communicates with the outside world. You just always talk to the proxy server, to the reverse proxy server, and he does all the work for you to the outside world. So this way you're well protected. All right, spam filters. Spam filters are used to block unwanted um, advertisements through emails, typically um, advertisements or for-profit uh, attacks or whatever. So what the, that's what the spam filters are. Typically they go on to the post office protocol server version three. And um, so you want to definitely make sure, like I said earlier, and maybe in one of other other lecture, is you always want to, if they, you flag any emails that you really don't want. So this way it goes into the proxy, I'm sorry, in proxy, the spam filter. And then next, you know, next time you get an email for those from those people, it will definitely be blocked. Remember, when you send an email, it goes into the SMTP server. The SMTP passes the data around till you finally get to the POP server, the post office server. So you always send an email to an SMTP server and you receive an email from the POP server, from the post office. Right? It could be the same machine, 
but it's two different software, two different protocols. All right. The SMTP works on port 25. So any anytime you want to send an email, you have to stamp your email with port number 25 and the and the SMTP server will be able to grab it because he's looking for listening to port number 25. If it's port 110, that's the POP server when you are receiving data. All right, so when you send an email, it goes to the SMTP server and it hops from one SMTP server to another till you finally get to the POP server at your destination. All right, that's and that's that. VPN, virtual private network. Well, if you have your headquarters, let's say in Dallas, Texas, and you have a whole bunch of branch offices all over the country, um, and you like all of these branch offices to connect to you in Dallas, um, because there are a lot of resources in Dallas that they need, such as servers or whatever that you need them to connect. Now you can go privately and pay, you know, pay a lot of money for a secure connection to Dallas. But the best way to do it is to go through the internet because you're, you know, almost most likely you're connected to the internet and whatever you're paying for the internet and you can reach Dallas easily. The only problem with using the public internet is if your data goes on the internet, you know, the internet is not regulated. Nobody's watching it and uh, anything can go on it and um, unsupervised either. So once you start traveling on the internet, there's a lot of viruses, there's people looking over all the data that's being passed through and uh, they may block you from getting to your destination. That's where the virtual private comes in, virtual private network. A VPN is the interconnection of two networks like the branch office uh, and let's say New York that needs to connect to the headquarters in Chicago. What, what we're going to do is we're going to create a tunnel and then encrypt the data and put it inside the tunnel. What that means is you're going to take your packet, you're going to encrypt it, and then you're going to re-encapsulate it with another packet. The re-encapsulation of the encrypted packet is called the tunneling. So this way you can't see it. That means you just hide it in another packet, right? But the data inside, so if anybody ever got inside the tunnel, the encapsulated packet, they won't be able to decipher what the data is because it's encrypted. That's what a VPN. And then the data is, can, the only people that will be able to know the connection and decide the, the tunneling and, and the encrypted data is the sender and the receiver. When we take a, a Cisco security class, we'll be able to set a site-to-site -site VPN, right? But for now, I want you to write down the definition of what a VPN is, right? Well, here's what I want you to do, is the interconnection between a remote, it could be a host or a network, a one, one device or a whole network, to another host or another network over the internet. So the connection of two remote devices or networks over the internet where they use, where you, where you encrypt the data and re-encapsulate it in another packet. If you want technical terms, that means you have a, sec where you encrypt the data in a secured tunnel. How about that? You can write that down. All right. The endpoints are your devices who is connected. You can, it's very, very easy to set up VPNs. It's not as hard as you think you, uh, you think it is. Uh, you can have a concentrator, which is really a device, you know, and it has, you know, you just type in the, your IP address and the destination IP address that you're trying to do, and these devices will take care of everything for you. But you got to make sure that they're the same device is on the other end. Um, 
when we do it in our labs, we can we have many uh, different choices that we can set up a VPN because it could be set up to any connections all over the country, or in fact, all over the world. Um, or you can hire a third party to do a VPN. So instead of anytime you want to connect to the outside world, you just go to, you know, somebody that you're paying to uh, the connection and they take all your data and set you up for the VPN. You don't have to do anything. You just send the data to them and you're always secured. And the data always goes through them then to you. And they do everything in terms of security for you. Uh, not only set you a VPN, they can set up firewalls. Everything has to go through them. And they'll give you only the good stuff, which is probably, you know, they can do that right now. There's plenty of uh, uh, cybersecurity companies that are out there in the cloud. So you don't have, in fact, what they have right now in the cloud, they, they can provide security. Just, you know, even Amazon Web Services, I think they do that as well, uh, where you pay them a fee and uh, remotely they can check your devices and see what you need and send you all the protections that you need without you even doing anything. Internet filters. Internet filters are really nice because, especially if you have a family with kids and uh, minors and you don't want them to access specific web pages, they can monitor the internet traffic, block access to specific websites and files and and things like that. Uh, but you, you got, if you spend a couple of weeks on it and, you know, they have, you know, the defaults are there, but you can always add websites that you don't want your minors or your kids or anyone that you don't want them to have access to. Um, the older versions used to be a pain because they used to block almost everything, you know, um, you know, unintended blocks. Let me put it that way. Um, those, you know, you can purchase those. In fact, some web browsers allows you to, uh, to do some content filtering too, if you want to. Anyway, so they can actually do URL content filtering, malware filtering, prohibit file downloads, all right, all of that. Web security gateways, such as, you know, like a, a server that can block malicious content in real time, block content through application level filtering as well. So they can block active X objects, adware, spywares, all of that. Again, like I said, you could do that in the cloud too, which is really nice nowadays. And you just pay a fee, a monthly fee, and you don't have to worry about the headache about um, setting anything up. You just connect to them with a username and a password, and they'll go through a whole bunch of setup remotely, configuring and taking care of your device. Again, the connection may be slow in the beginning, but you're secured. All right, now we're going to get to um, the IDSs, the intrusion detection system that we talked about. This is the one that we pre uh, earlier talked about. You know, this is where you set it up on the port mirroring, if you remember just a few slides ago. Uh, so an IDS system detects a pattern of attack. A pattern, really, sometimes we call that a signature. So if there's a, a specific signature of an attack, it can recognize it. And typically, the IDS sends out an alert if there's a critical, something went wrong. And that alert is usually connects to the firewall, and the firewall will block the, the stream of data that's coming in the attack itself. Um, now, here are the four types of monitoring to monitor methodologies. I want you to write these down, all four of them, and the definitions of each one of them. And then I'll explain each one of them in a minute, right now. Anomaly-based monitoring means what you're going to do is you're going to set up a baseline. It may, may take days, weeks, months of what's normal on the network. And then the IDS will come in and it will have that baseline as a reference. If there is something that is abnormal, out of the ordinary, it immediately will um, send out a flag, a red flag. There's a problem. In other words, for example, if there is tr you know, normal traffic is always, everything is fine. There is very, very slow traffic after 8 p.m., almost no traffic. If all of a sudden 
you know, there's a spike in traffic at 9 p.m. on a on a Friday night, and that will immediately trigger a flag and probably tells the IDS will tell the firewall to block it. Signature base is depending on the pattern. Um, this is like works like um, antivirus program where they have um, definitions, you know, definitions uh, of the of viruses, and every file that comes in is trying to match with a definition, and a flag will come up if if there is a match. With signature-based monitoring, what you're going to do is you have you know a lot of the different types of attacks, what their patterns, what their signatures are. And if you noticed an attack with that pattern, you immediately send out a flag. Behavior-based detects the abnormal actions of process of programs. If a program is supposed to do a specific thing and all of a sudden it started doing something else, you immediately trigger a flag. Heuristic monitoring is experience-based technology. So depending on the experience, then you know that this device should not be able to do something, for example, or so not this device should not, uh, for even to set up, send out IP addresses, like it's set up as a DHCP, right? All right, so those are the four different types of methodologies to monitor and uh, to monitor traffic, looking for types of denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks. So if you have set up an IPS or an IDS will be set up to do that. Host IDSs are the ones that are sit on the computer, right? Software based. So you want to also have that once the, or you can have the, what's called the NIDS, the network intrusion detections, that one that sits on the edge of the network. Network IDSs. Uh, typically, that's what's done. There are soft IDSs. Uh, I mean, host IDSs that sits on the computers. You can have both, of course, for better protection. So you can check the traffic at the network with NIDs, and when they come into your computer, you can check them with your host, with the heads, right? NIPs. I want you to write down what NIPs are. Please write these. Um, three points. The difference between the NIPs and the NIDs with the D is that the prevention system is, like I said earlier, um, monitors and checks the traffic that's in line coming into the network. If it sees the, uh, you know, there's a pattern that it needs to stop the traffic, it will stop it immediately. It will never reach the network at all which is really good. That's what you want, right? Again, the only disadvantage of NIPs is that uh, it slows things down a little bit. There's a little bit of latency. Okay. More and more people definitely are using NIPs. All right, the network address translation. NAT is um, in the early 1990s, when we noticed that we are running out of IP addresses, uh, we were able to develop uh, a protocol that allowed that one IP address, for example, by using port numbers next to it, allowed us to have multiple addresses, private IP addresses, will be able to connect to the internet using one IP address. So we really kind of increased the amount of IP addresses um, that are available. In the early 1990s, there was a block of IP addresses that we reserved that we can use inside our LAN, and you don't have to pay for them, but you cannot access the internet with these private IP addresses. You know, private IP addresses that starts with 10, anything that starts with 172.20 all the way to 172.31, and anything that starts with 192.168. If your IP address starts with any of these, you cannot access the internet with with these. 
when you want to get on the internet, you send your data to the router. Router, what it does is it takes your private IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.10.3. It removes it, give you a public IP address. You go on the internet, and when you come back, you get your private IP address, right? Uh, PAT is where you can have one public IP address, and it can service multiple private IP addresses using one private IP. Again, we will configure this and set it up in one of our Cisco classes. What I want you to write about NAT is that the advantages of NAT is it conserves I public IP addresses and it's a little bit more secure. That's why we call it uh, private IP addresses. It secures the internal network because people on the outside will not be able to see what the what your internal IP address is. But the major, this is another point, the major disadvantage of NAT is that it creates latency delay because every time you want to go in and out of the network, you have to wait to be translated. Okay, and there's your uh, block of IP addresses, the private ones to get on the internet. And we wrote that down. Okay, now let's talk about the DMZ zones, subnetting, VLANs, and remote access. The DMZ zone. You want to make sure that, um, for example, this is your internal network on this side, and here's your demilitarized zone. So if you have any web servers, any servers that need to be accessed from the outside, the public needs to access, you want to put them outside your network, right? You don't want to put them inside here, these web pages, because if there's an attack, they can come into the network. And once they're inside the network, they can screw up the whole network. So what you do with uh, public access devices, you put them outside, but you need to protect them. You know, you put them on, on the boundary. So you protect them with another firewall, maybe a separate firewall. This is cool. So in case anything goes wrong, they are in a demilitarized zone outside your land. Right, but they still need to be protected. Subnetting. Um, when we're running out of IP addresses, um, subnetting meaning you're breaking the network into smaller and smaller networks. An IP address really identifies the zip code, the area that the device is located. If that area is huge and there's a lot of devices in it, to, add, to talk to each other becomes impossible right the performance becomes very slow so what we do is it's just like taking one big area zone and we break it up into little zones subnet it right and give each one of them their own zip code smaller network how do we do that we can use you know each zone or each area should be connected to a switch. So we're not gonna buy switches for all of them. So what we do is we create VLANs. We can buy one big, huge switch. Each VLAN should be on their own subnet. So write that down. Each VLAN should be on their own subnet, right? Here's another point I want you to write down. A VLAN, equal to uh, a virtual switch, right? An IP address, a network IP address is equal to, is an analogous to a zip code, right? An area, the number, right? The actual physical area is the VLAN, is the, uh, is the switch. Just want to make sure I want to make sure that you understand what we're talking about. The more the, the smaller the area, right? The smaller the VLAN, the smaller the subnet, the less people that are in it, and you can access your resources much quicker. It's more secure, so you can secure it. So, for example, you can put all the uh, the top administrators in the organization in one area, and you can secure it with a firewall and everything that you need. You don't want them to be part of everyone else, right? Uh, for example, typically we set up voice in one LAN, in one VLAN by themselves. 
so that we give priorities to, the, to, to them. That's when we're setting up QoS, quality of service. So for example, all the voice, uh, voice over IP connections go to, let's say VLAN number 20. So we can go to the router and if you're say we're coming from VLAN 20, make sure or going out from VLAN 20, you got priority first because we don't want any delay with voice over IP, right? All right, so that's the planning. VLAN's remote access is, of course, just to be able to connect to the outside wall. Here's one note I want you to write with remote access. If you want to do some remote access, host to be remotely accessed into the network, uh, it's preferable to use IPv6. Uh, because IPv6 already has IP security in it, and there is no need for NAT, which means you will not have any delay and you are better secured. Again, if you want to use remote access, it's preferable to use IPv6 instead of IPv4 because IPv6 has better security and no NAT and AT is needed. Therefore, data go moves quicker. All right. So that's what you need to know with remote access. All right. And that ends our chapter in network security. So until we meet again on the next chapter, keep up the good work. Please do your homework. And, and if, you're, uh, if you're behind, catch up as quickly as possible. I'll see you on the next chapter.